1997, WWE, then the WWF, held their first ever Hell in a Cell match, contested between the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels, and the Dead Man, The Undertaker, at Bad Blood in Your House. The show itself is not terribly well regarded, but the main event between Shawn and The Undertaker is considered one of the all-time best, being only the fourth WWE match to receive five stars from the infamous Dave Meltzer. The stipulation would make its return to pay-per-view a year later on the June 28, 1998 edition of King of the Ring, with the infamous match between The Undertaker and perhaps his best-remembered opponent, Mick Foley, aka Mankind. The match is best known for the spot where the dead man and Mankind fought atop the cell, and The Undertaker would grab Mankind by his throat and deliver a choke slam onto the roof of the cage, but in an unplanned spot, the cell roof would actually fail and cause Foley to crash into the ring through the cell and cause the poor man multiple injuries, which Foley would then continue to fight through until finally being pinned after a tombstone pile driver after 17 minutes and 38 seconds of action. The match will receive rave reviews as well, getting 4.5 stars from Dave Meltzer, who declared that Foley would forever be associated with the Hell in a Cell, and he was dead right. This week marks 25 years since the most iconic Hell in a Cell match ever produced. And while matches like Sean vs. Taker, Mankind vs. Taker, Triple H vs. Cactus Jack, Taker vs. Triple H, Edge vs. Seth Rollins, and Cody Rhodes vs. Seth Rollins have all been praised, there's also been plenty of matches that have been met with plenty of scorn. Matches like The Undertaker vs. Big Boss Man, Undertaker vs. CM Punk, Seth Rollins vs. Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns vs. Braun Strowman, and Seth Rollins vs. The Fiend. Many fans in recent years have been claiming that WWE have really abused their Hell in a Cell stipulation and, and have really oversaturated it. For instance, in 2021, WWE held a whopping five matches under the stipulation, three happening at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, one on the SmackDown episode before the pay-per-view, one on the Raw episode immediately after the pay-per-view, and then a fifth one several months after the fact at the Crown Jewel pay-per-view. Now, looking back on it, you'll notice this wasn't the first time WWE spammed this stipulation, seeing as from the stipulation's debut in October of 1997 to WrestleMania 15 in March of 1999, the company also held five freaking cell matches without any real stakes save for the original, two which were also held on television, with all of this happening over the course of 18 months. In other words, like with a lot of issues with the company, the same issues that are present today were also present in their golden years. That being said though, in the spirit of the season, I'm going to be sitting down and giving you all my top 5 best and worst Hell in a Cell matches. Because sometimes you gotta take the good with the bad. Sometimes you need a crappy match between an evil dark wizard cult leader and a correctional officer from Georgia to get to an amazing match between an undead zombie wizard biker cowboy anti-hero and a motorhead fanboy from Connecticut. Sometimes you need a crappy match between an extremely tall redneck and a Samoan guy with a fetish for tactical gear to get to an amazing match between a fashion obsessed psycho and an American flag obsessed psycho. Sometimes you need an awful match between a guy on steroids and a grumpy ass punk rocker to get to an epic match between two men in their early 40s and two men in their mid 20s. So with all that said, Take it away, Mr. Cumberbatch. Now, shall we begin? Honorable Mentions. D-Generation X vs. Legacy at Hell in a Cell 2009. If this match was held just two years earlier, it would have been perfect. The only thing missing in this match is a little bit of blood. Otherwise, it's perfect. Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. jump Triple H and Sean right before the match. Then they shove Sean in and lock the cell from the inside and just beat the living fuck out of him until it looks like Triple H has given up on saving his friend until he comes right back out with a pair of bolt cutters. And then, he and HBK turn the tables on Cody. Hunter slips in, and he shoves out Oted, and then quadruple HBK lay the smacketh down on the future American Nightmare. 
give Sean and Cody a pair of crimson masks and it would be perfect. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. 4.25 out of 5. Kurt Angle versus Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Triple H versus Rikishi versus The Undertaker versus The Rock at Armageddon 2000. Five of the best guys of the era, plus Jimmy and Jay Uso's dad, all locked in a cage. It's absolute chaos and it's absolutely glorious. Four out of five. Cause baby, now we got bad blood. You know it used to be mad love. So take uh, a look what you've done. Uh, Cause baby, now we got bad blood. Uh, Triple H versus Shawn Michaels at Bad Blood 2004. It's way too long, but it's an extremely compelling story of two men who used to be best friends but have grown so far apart that they just hate each other now. And that makes for a pretty special match. 3.75 out of 5. The top 5. So give the blood, blood, gallons of the stuff. Give them all that they can drink and it will never be enough. So give them blood, blood, blood. Grab a glass because there's going to be a flood. Number 5. The Undertaker vs. Shawn Michaels at Bad Blood in Your House, 1997. Shawn and The Undertaker set the bar very high with this first match. It starts with HBK at his late 90s peak as a smug little prick with a shit-eating grin who thinks he's invincible, opposite The Undertaker, who gives him a very rude awakening. Sean realizes early on he's stepped into a cage with a very angry, very tall man who's very good at beating people up, and he's, in, and he's the reason why this very tall man is so very angry right now. So he does everything he can to make these people let him out, but like the monster in a horror movie, it doesn't matter how fast or how far you run away, the Undertaker is always right behind, and he's always ready to rip Sean's guts out. The Heartbreak Kid's only escape comes from the debut of Kane, who breaks into the cell and tombstones Taker to simply send a message. Sean quickly takes advantage of said message, but it's pretty clear, even if he's the one who walks away the winner, he sure as hell doesn't feel like the winner. 4.5 out of 5. Cody Rhodes vs. Seth Rollins at Hell in a Cell 2022. An incredible performance from an incredibly dumb wrestler. There's no reason in the world that Cody should have gone out and wrestled this match while injured, but he pulled it off brilliantly, and full credit to Seth's brilliant heel work as well. It's just a really great match. Corey Graves called it perfectly at the ending. An angel with a broken wing went to hell to do battle with a demon and survived. 4.75 out of 5. Martin, babe, mirror, babe, gone insane, but the memory remains. Number three, Triple H versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 28. I'm normally not a fan of matches that are interrupted with melodrama, but this is the exception that proves the rule for me. This match is still more of an actual match than it is just theatrics, but the theatrics are part of a lot of long-running stories here. There's the story of Sean as a special guest referee who's been best friends with Triple H for years, but has had a long story of earning The Undertaker's respect from going from the snot-nosed punk who snuck out a win from Taker in this very same stipulation 15 years earlier, to closing out and opening up the 2007 and 2008 Royal Rumbles together, to battling each other at WrestleMania's 25 and 26, and earning each other's respect at the end of those matches. There's Triple H, who's been friends with Shawn for years, but who's never been able to get a definitive win over The Undertaker in their 15 years long rivalry. And there's The Undertaker, who at this point has won 19 consecutive matches at WrestleMania, and is looking to claim either his 20th victory or his first loss. And all he wants is to either walk away with his shield or lay down on it. 
He has to continually appeal to his and Sean's newfound mutual respect because Sean is so desperate to call up this match because he doesn't want to see essentially his father and his brother kill each other. But of course, the match finally ends with The Undertaker claiming a hard-fought 20th victory, and the three men walk off into the sunset together, with Taker and Hunter joining Sean in retirement. 4.75 out of 5. What? Brock Lesnar, Saudi Arabia? The, the Authority? What What the hell are you talking about? What are you talking about? Number 2. The Undertaker vs. Mankind at King of the Ring, 19. 98. If Shawn Michaels helped The Undertaker define the Hell in a Cell match, then Mick Foley helped Taker perfect the Hell in a Cell match. Even if we've seen every single possible variation of these spots in this match 25 years later, you can thank Mick for every bit of it because that poor man was a danger to his own well-being. So many of the tropes that are kind of eye-roll inducing now, they were established here, but they weren't so bad because they were legit. This wasn't kayfabe. This wasn't a wrestler trying to prove how tough he is. This was a wrestler just being that damn tough. You know the trope where a wrestler will get tied up onto a stretcher and then untie themselves and get back into the match because they're finishing this damn thing? Yeah, Mick did that because he was certifiable back then. He didn't do that because he wanted the crowd to think he was a man. He did that because he was a man. <laughs> five out of five, absolutely incredible. No, no mercy, no mercy, no mercy, and I won't back down. No mercy, no mercy, no mercy, and I won't back down. Number one, Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at No Mercy 2002. This one's a bit of a grower. It starts off kind of slow, but the longer it goes, the more intense it gets and the more exciting it gets. This is a match that definitely makes great use of blood by having Taker mostly just control the match to start with until Brock gets in a lucky shot and takes over. And when The Undertaker starts to bleed, you really suddenly feel the danger for Mark Calloway. This was definitely one of Biker Taker and Young Brock's better performances. These two had unbelievable chemistry as opponents. And the fact that there aren't more great matches between these two is a damn shame. If you had to end the streak, this was the perfect guy to do it. 5.25 out of 5. Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns at Hell in a Cell 2020. Okay, full transparency. While I do genuinely dislike this match, this entry is mostly just here to trigger some friends of mine who adore Roman. I will say though, Roman has appeared in five Hell in a Cell matches, and this is probably his weakest performance in the stipulation. He's a terrific heel, but I think his actual in-ring work is much more lacking in this attempt at soap opera storytelling. This isn't a match, it's an angle. There's 10 minutes of actual wrestling here, even though the actual runtime of the match is 30 godforsaken minutes. None of this is bad, but when I turn on the TV and I'm told I'm about to watch a wrestling match, then I want to watch a freaking wrestling match. Don't give me a 10 minute match and then put off in a 20 minute community theater performance. Give me a 30 minute match, for God's sake. 2.5 out of 5. Money. Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32. This matchup has never made any sense to me. If this was the Attitude Era, I could see Shane having a small chance of victory. If they did this match a year earlier or a year later at WrestleMania 31 or 33, I'd get it. Either say The Undertaker was still recovering from losing his streak and the outcome was in doubt now, or 
say he's gaining his confidence back, but the thought of not doing WrestleMania ever again really scares him. I could get that. But this was Shane McMahon coming back after a decade away. And this was who you want to put up against The Undertaker? No! Honestly, I'd say this match could have really worked great with a younger heel who could really get over with the audience. In fact, looking at this card, I'd switch up Dean Ambrose and Undertaker's opponents. Give the clean-cut suburban dad-looking guy a match against the grungy guy, and give us a rematch of WrestleMania 30, since Brock isn't in the title picture at the moment. One last match. Can The Undertaker redeem his streak, or will Brock continue to prove that he's the better man? But no, instead we got a match with two really mismatched opponents, where the only real notable spot was Shane's big elbow drop, which actually was pretty cool. Still though, 2.25 out of 5. When you see my face, hope it gives you hell, hope it gives you hell. When you walk my way, hope it gives you hell, hope it gives you hell. Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose at Hell in a Cell 2015. A blood feud for the ages, and it's derailed by a weird angle with Bray Wyatt. This is a match that craves the Hell in a Cell stipulation. Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, two brothers who were torn apart by Seth's greed. It's a story that would be brilliant in a Hell in a Cell match, and WWE screwed it up by being WWE. Two out of five. The bottom five. Number 5, The Undertaker vs. Kane at Hell in a Cell 2010. You ever notice how despite being so deeply tied to each other's history, and how they're famous for being each other's most hated rivals and greatest teammate? You ever notice how despite all of that, Kane and The Undertaker basically have no chemistry as in-ring opponents? This match is so slow and awkward and the finish is so damn cheap, I really can't stand it when the finish of a match designed to prevent outside interference ends because of outside interference. It's just so boring and dull and uninteresting and just 1.75 out of 5. Just bleh. Number 4, Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman at Hell in a Cell 2018. You know, this was Braun Strowman's Money in the Bank cash-in. They even got Mick Foley to be the special guest referee, and Roman versus Braun was probably one of the better rivalries of WWE in the late 2010s. And you know, the actual match isn't half bad until Brock Lesnar broke into the cell and beat the shit out of Braun and Roman and made it a no contest because... Fuck you. 1.5 out of 5. Number 3. CM Punk vs. Ryback at Hell in a Cell 2012. So, I was originally going to do a full ranking video for every single Cell match, but I decided to just do a top 5 best and worst list instead of just a full video ranking all 52 matches because that would have been way too damn long. But when I wrote that script, I described Ryback as basically Braun Strowman 1.0. And you know what, say what you want about Braun, he may be stupid, he may be a jerk, he may be a right wing loony and a Fight Club fan who really misunderstood the movie, or at least he's actually fun to watch in the ring. He has a big personality to go with his big presence. He has an actual style that was exciting to watch, while Ryback is... 6'3 and 291 pounds. Cool. Well, at least he has a great hero to bounce off of. Except CM Punk is in chicken shit heel mode in this match, and Ryback is the underdog babyface who loses because Punk paid off the ref. Outstanding. 1.25 out of 5. Fuck you.
Number two, Cain vs. Mankind at Raw is War, August 1998. This was the second Hell in a Cell match to be put on TV, but the first to be ruled a no contest. This is also an early example of of a frequent issue with a lot of promotions in general, but especially WWE. The bookers are so fixated on the plan that they don't take into consideration what's happened recently. Instead of a main event match that has Kane and Mankind as powers of equal strength, you have them opening up the second hour and have Kane effortlessly manhandling Mankind, who ends up needing to be rescued by Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, this was two months, just two months, after Mankind put his body on the line at King of the Ring. And you decide to book a match where Kane effortlessly overpowers him. No big spots, just Kane beating up Mankind for 15 minutes until Steve Austin shows up. Why would you book this? Why, why the fuck would you just... Why? 1.125 out of 5. Big Boss Man Can't you hear me when I call? Big Boss Man Can't you Number 1. The Undertaker versus The Big Boss Man at WrestleMania 15. This match gives me nothing to talk about. The angle following the match and going into it is pretty cool, but the actual match has nothing to discuss. It's mostly just two guys smacking each other around until The Undertaker gets a low blow in on the big boss man and then finishes him off with a tombstone pile driver. It is, without a doubt, the least memorable match in the history of the stipulation. The only memorable thing about the match is what happens right after it. The Undertaker wins. And then out come the brood who send down a rope to allow the Undertaker to fucking hang the big boss man. Which is cool, but it doesn't save the match. One out of five. Jesus Christ. And those were my top five best and worst Hell in a Cell matches. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do you agree or disagree with my top fives? Comment below and tell me what you think. If you're interested in hearing my original rankings for these matches, go check out my script from April over on my blog. I'll have that post linked in the description. But before you go, be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and share this video with your friends. I have a handful of other videos about professional wrestling on this channel, but for the most part, I've been discussing comic book movies with a recent emphasis on Yu-Gi-Oh! as well. If you're interested in any of that, check out the playlist down below. If you're just here for wrestling, come stop by February when I tackle a project that I've been flirting with for a while, but I've never really committed to. I'll be doing a video discussing every single world championship reign held by a black wrestler in WWE and ranking them from worst to best. But if you feel like sticking around until then, I'll be dropping a review for Season 1 of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX in the very near future. Until then, have a great day everyone. Woodstock, out.